But that's not a necessary arrangement. All you gotta do is look down at the little creatures that are inhabiting the planet with you, and you look at things like arthropod faces, and look at them, they're adorable. And they're <laughs> very different. <laughs> See, uh, if, if, for instance, if that, if that guy in the middle lands on your front lawn and asks for a cup of tea, you're probably not going to confuse him with Richard Wiseman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just the superficial differences, uh, it's about deep functional differences. So let me give you one example, or to one example of a, of a very different kind of solution to a common physiological problem. And that is, how do you eat in an aquatic environment? If you evolved in an ocean, uh, you have a problem if you are a large, fierce predator, and you're swimming around and you want to charge over here and eat this, this tasty little shrimp that's coming along, for instance. Because if you're in a dense medium like water and you rush forward, you're also pushing this mass of water ahead of you. And as you push that mass of water ahead of you, it will arrive at your prey before you do, and it will nicely push the shrimp out of the field of view, and you go scoot right past it and miss it. This is bad if you're trying to eat, right? <laughs> now, we don't have this, this problem with thin medium. Air doesn't do this, but water, it, it's a big problem. So let's think about how you catch that tasty food item in front of you. And bony fish have come up with a brilliant solution. What it is, is they have toothy jaws. You all know this. Think of a shark, nice toothy jaws. Uh, and what they also have, though, is this regular cranial ballet of fine adaptations that allow them to capture prey. What they do is they, as they go forward is, as they're advancing, they open their jaws wide, which increases the volume of the oral cavity. And they also flare those gill arches, those gill opercula, these shields that cover the gills, which also increase the volume. So what they're basically doing is they rush forward, they greatly increase the volume of their oral cavity, which gulps in all that air, and they basically suck in their prey. So it's a combination of rushing forward and gaping to suck in that volume of water and catch their prey that way. That's brilliant. That works. That really works well. And it's one of the keys to success of bony fish is this, this amazing feeding mechanism they have. Now, um, some fish go even further, and I just had to show you this because this, this is awesome. Uh, this is a moray eel. And moray eels have another adaptation that helps them out. They've got the big jaws, chomp chomp, and then they got a second pair of jaws slung deep in the back of their throat, which I think you can see up there. And what they do is they gape, they suck in all that water as they charge forward, and then they also sling that internal set of jaws forward to chomp and hold on to the prey. So they clamp on like this, and then the big jaws go chomp, 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 and tear it to shreds. Oh, it's really sexy and cool. Anyway, but they got these internal jaws that just hold it in place and maybe do a little bit of biting and make life miserable the last few seconds of its existence. Uh, but the big ones do most of the work. Now that's just amazing. That's beautiful. You may have seen this somewhere else, too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> looks familiar. So yes, we bring aliens in here. Okay. Geiger looked at a lot of biology, and I think he had some hints about what's going on with these fish from that. So anyway, here's his brain solution. It's led to a great deal of success in the bony fish. Uh, there are something like 30,000 species of bony fish, which is a great record of success. Um, and this is one of the tools that they use. So, is this the only way to solve that hydrodynamic problem? And of course not. You're all sitting there thinking, oh, I know an answer to this one, because I read Meyer's blog all the time, so I just know he's going to bring up squid. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Of course. So, what these are, these are frames from a high-speed cinematographic record of a squid catching a shrimp. Each frame in this video is separated by 10 milliseconds. So the entire time covered by this, these series of frames is about an eighth of a second. So, wham, this is, this is instant stuff to our eyes. This is really, really fast stuff. Now what you see here is the squid solution to this hydrodynamic problem. It starts off with all 10 arms pressed tightly against one, each other, one another in front of each other, making this, this sharp pointed cone. Again, useful for advancing, you know, nice and streamlined. And then what happens is the central two tentacles are launched forward like a spear, 
So that's what you're seeing there is these central tentacles reaching forward really fast to smack into the prey and grab it with its suckers and teeth and things that are hanging out there. And at the same time, all the other tentacles are splaying out and sweeping backwards to counterbalance the forward movement of the spear. That's gorgeous. That's, that's a really cool solution. Okay. Uh, imagine an alien that evolved, an intelligent alien that evolved from this mechanism, that evolved with this kind of, of thing that it's used to ca capture prey. And you confront it on the dark night as its UFO lands. Uh, what will you see? You will see all these horrible sharp tentacles with claws and hooks sticking out in front of it. And uh, it will wave hello by spearing you with a couple of them. And making a great display, a flowering display of all of its other tentacles. It will look, look pretty. Give me your last few moments. <laughs> okay, but what it is, it's the same physical problem for both fish and squid. They both have to catch their prey. Uh, but what's radically different is the biological solutions that they came up with. Now, why do they differ so much? Why have they come up with such different solutions? And one reason is history. You cannot ignore history when you're looking at evolutionary biology. So, different phyla of organisms have different ancestral roots, which constrains the available solutions. On the top is an inferred Precambrian chordate. It has a dorsal nerve cord, like we do, running up our back. Uh, it's got a central springy skeleton called the notochord, and it's got this postanal tail, this extension of its body that's there as a little flap to assist it in swimming. So this is an animal specialized for swimming. That's our ancestor, and it has no limbs. Uh, limbs evolved later, and they were kind of this last minute change, they got kind of bolted on to our bodies. Uh, this is why we have this deficiency of limbs I was complaining about earlier, and this is why we have bipedalism. At the bottom was a very different body plan. This is an arthropod. Uh, key elements of their body plan are an inversion of the pattern relative to us. So for instance, they have a ventral nerve cord. It runs down here. So yeah, if you ever want to kill a giant insect that's attacking you, Right here, we'll hit them right in, the, in their equivalent of a spine. So just, just keep that in mind when you cook, meet those aliens. <laughs> and, and also what you can see then is that every segment has a limb on it. Arthropods have had limbs to spare. In their evolutionary hair history, they have never had a shortage of limbs. And what you find is that there's a consolidation and a specialization of limbs in their history. Uh, what, what, what you typically find when you look at the evolution of an insect is that they, they, they essentially take a few of these limbs, they rearrange them and put them in places like in their mouth, their head to act as mouth parts, or they modify them further down and use them for genitalia. There's all kinds of exotic things that are going on with their limbs. So that top picture is our heritage. It, it affects everything evolution can do to modify its descendants, our descendants. And it's easy to see how some forms are dependent on them. So here, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, one of these pinnacles of vertebrate evolution. This is the bony fish again. There are over 30,000 species of fish. So hands down, this is the most successful vertebrate solution ever. So note the streamlined form, that kind of torpedo shape that you see up there. Its internal skeleton is a flexible spring, uh, and it's flight by these big slabs of muscle that propel it through the water. And at its front end is this sensory array, eyes and pressure and olfactory organs, um, and those elaborate prey capture reflexes that I already mentioned. So this is the perfect product of adaptive function. Surely every planet we visit sometime, someday, will have to have fish oils, right? Torpedo sheet predators with sensory organs at the front end. That's going to be universal, you'd say, because, man, this, this is a really good way to build an organism. Well, hang on, wait, again, you guys have read my blog, you know what's coming. <laughs> Here is the perfect product of adaptive evolution, okay? Physics dictates the torpedo shape. Fish and squid both have that torpedo shape. But there are many arrangements of body parts that can produce that, can produce that same shape. So here, the sensory array is mid-body. The front is dominated by these elaborate manipulatory organs, the arms of the cephalopod. There is no internal skeleton. 